face. And Facebook is going live. Cast this is live. Good evening. This is the regional summit meeting between Wakefield, Reading, Stoneham, Melrose, Linfield, and Saugus. And good evening, everyone, and thank you for taking part in this meeting. I'm Ed Dombrowski, the town council chairman from, from the town of Wakefield, and it's my distinct honor this evening to, to welcome our, our neighbors of Reading, Melrose, Stoneham, Linfield, and Saugus uh, to take part in this first of what will hopefully be a series of regional summit meetings where we can all uh, together as, as a region uh, discuss a number of issues, uh, share a number of best practices, and, and hopefully uh, work out a, a number of different collaborations going forward in, in the uh, year, months and years to come. Before I begin, I do know that we have the um, select board of Reading, the entire select board, and so I'll turn it over for the moment uh, to the select board chair to call the meeting to order for their purposes. Thanks, Ed. This is Mark Doxer, the chair of the Reading Select Board. I'd like to call uh, the meeting of the Reading Select Board to order. Thank you for that, Mark. And again, um, th this evening, it it's, it's intended to be a free flow of, of ideas. I hope that we'll be able to share some of our best practices and be able to talk about opportunities that may, my, may lay, lie ahead for us. Um, as, as a region, if we think about ourselves as as uh, six different communities coming together for a common purpose, and and I do think we have a lot of opportunity here uh, to go through and and discuss a number of aspects of how we all govern, uh, what we do, and how we can you know perhaps learn from each other and and collaborate going forward. Uh, with that, we have a a fairly uh, packed agenda this evening, but I am also mindful of everyone's time. And I do wanna make sure we move through this agenda quickly, uh, but make sure we have a good dialogue going throughout. So with that in mind, I would just ask that if everyone, when you're not speaking, if you could please mute to make sure that we don't have any uh, distractions from background noise. And also uh, when you're looking to make a comment, if you could please raise your hands uh, and I'll be sure to, to call on each of you. And if you could also identify yourself and, and the community from which you serve, that would also be much appreciated. Uh, this evening we have town administrators, um, uh, town managers, and uh, members of select boards, city, uh, the Metro City Council, the Town Council in Wakefield, and uh, uh, boards of selectmen as well. So with that, um, I'll begin with the agenda with the second item following introductions, and that is managing expectations and, and promoting public safety. Uh, certainly, this was an idea that um, I had hoped to have under different circumstances. Uh, I don't think any of us anticipated a year ago that we'd find ourselves in the current pandemic that we do, but nonetheless, we're all adapting and responding. So with that in mind, um, it seems like an appropriate time for all of us to come together to, to share some of our thoughts in terms of uh, where we've been thus far, where we see ourselves going from a, a municipal governing perspective, and ways that we can get there most effectively and efficiently. So with that, um, the item managing expectations and promoting public safety is really looking at what we're doing currently and what we may be able to do uh, differently going forward into the future and how we can learn from each other and perhaps adopt best practices or perhaps be more coordinated in our approach. Um, this evening is, is certainly um, not about deliberations. Uh, there are no votes being taken, but it, instead it's an opportunity for all of us to share ideas and thoughts. And, and the hope is that each of the uh, delegations that we have we have represented here from the six communities will be able to go back to their respective communities and talk about you know what we've discussed here now um, and then hopefully we we can begin a dialogue that will again will be going on for the, for the weeks months and, and ideally years to come so one of the first things that comes up I, I know for us as a town in Wakefield and certainly every community is is how we deal with open spaces um, uh, use use of open spaces pr currently be it for recreational assets or uh, perhaps for uh, events and what sorts of policies uh, we could see going forward. Um, we're certainly awaiting a lot of guidance from the governor at this point at the state level, but 
I'm sure that many of us are, are also interested in, in how we take that, that the governor's guidance and implement it in our, in our respective communities. So I, I'd open it up to everyone to, um, to ask you know, what you're finding currently with the policies you have in place and, and what direction you see uh, going forward and uh, with, with those policies, again, based upon um, the governor's anticipated recommendations in, in the coming weeks. Anyone wish to take the lead on that? I, I see, oh, actually, um, uh, Phil Crawford. Yes. We have to unmute, unmute myself unmute first. Yourself. Yeah. So, <laughs> thanks, Ed. Yeah, of course, we all are uh, governing by the guidance from the governor, but as far as Linfield goes, we are certainly um, uh, abiding by the governor's wishes and, and uh, uh, we've closed down everything in town. I think like, like every other town, you know, golf courses, parks, uh, playgrounds, uh, ball fields, everything's been closed. Uh, there's certainly a lot of uh, re requests to start opening things, uh, even though uh, the governor hasn't given us a timeline on that yet. We'd certainly like to see that. Uh, I think I think one of the things we'd like to see, uh, you know, based, based on his guidance, if, if we have some uh, chance to open something soon, we're probably going to be looking at maybe uh, the golf courses uh, would be open as soon as uh, as they allow. Uh, one of the other uh, big uh, programs in town is our Little League, which uh, every town has a, a very strong Little League, I'm sure. Uh, they're looking to do something in the summer. Uh, they know that that uh, spring season's not going to happen, but uh, there's a possibility of possibly doing an abbreviated summer season uh, in uh, in August or or whenever we can get back on those on those fields. So that's that's kind of what we're looking at for open space. Um, uh, there is there is some uh, miscellaneous use here and there. I'm sure everybody's seen that across their towns. You know, some people occasionally go out and use a tennis court or. Uh, kids shoot down there shooting at the basketball court, but you know, and, and uh, I've seen a few people uh, taking some uh, shots on the golf courses, but but uh, generally they've been pretty good uh, abiding by uh, the no use rules right now. And uh, as you know, it's going to be more challenging as the weather gets better. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's where um, that's where we are. It's 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 really uh, following the governor's lead and and. Uh, you know, we have multiple um, uh, leagues and groups ready to go as soon as we can open up something, but we'll, we'll do it slowly and, and, uh, and, and do it, you know, uh, in the best for safety for the town. So that's what I got. Thanks. Thank, thank you for that. And I do know a lot of towns, there is a lot of crossover. Braycart Reservation, for example, uh, Wakefield and Saugus share that. Um, I know that Lake Quantapowit here in Wakefield draws a number of visitors. Um, we, should, we should have a tax uh, for the number of surrounding communities that come to our, our lake. Um, in Pine Bakes uh, Field and Melrose, I know there are some issues there for some of our, our, our Metro City Councilors who have joined as well. So, yeah, and, and to your point, it does seem like that's going to be an issue that's going to be become more of an issue uh, as, as the weather improves and as people, the longer people are, 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 are staying at home and socially distanced. Do we have, do we have any other um, perspectives from any of other communities on this piece? Hi, this is Ann Landry from the, from the town of Reading, vice chair of the Reading Select Board. Uh, I would add that in, in some ways, the Board of Health in Reading has has come out ahead almost of some of the governor's orders, um, not inconsistent with any of the governor's orders. But for example, we had a, a um, mask order in place a few days before the governor issued uh, his order. And with respect to public spaces, there are some spaces that where we have our own um, town specific orders that I think are consistent with the governor's um, advisories with respect to social distancing, but not necessarily mandated by them um, or weren't originally, you know, for example, all of our town athletic facilities are, are closed, which is consistent certainly with the spirit of the governor's orders. Um, but we, our, our town forest is, is open um, and conservation land is open. 
So there, there's, um, depending on the type of open space, there is there are different rules to be followed. And are you finding that, that is, that's working well thus far? I would say so. We certainly do hear complaints from residents that some people are not respecting social distancing and are um, defying the orders and using athletic facilities in defiance. Although I know our, our facilities department has done things like tie off, um, zip tie the um, the basketball hoops and there, there's there there's signage letting people know that our athletic facilities are closed. Good. And I see that Mr. Mayo from Wakefield, the town administrator from Mayo, um, has his hand up as well. Um, uh, yes, yeah. um, thank you. And I, I just wanted to thank um, particularly the town of Stoneham because that's the only town that I haven't had a citizen call and yell at me about the lake being mm -hmm. Um, uh, cordoned off to no parking. So Stoneham gets a gold star um, uh, among the other communities. But I, I think that the um, what uh, Mr. Crawford was saying about the um, sports groups, we're hearing that in Wakefield too, both our, our youth sports and, our, um, and the adult sports groups. We have a very uh, active summer league um, and they're reaching to get back on the field. So we are waiting for guidance like everybody else. We also have a, um, putting together a brand new softball field um, for our um, seniors or for our softball team in high school. And it really is, is hard that uh, those kids, those seniors aren't going to get a game on that field this year. So we're going to figure hopefully something out at the end of the year that they can use it once. So um, yeah, we're having, we're having the same issues. The town forest is open. People are hiking. People should be hiking and walking. And um, I think now with the governor's uh, order uh, going into effect tomorrow morning, that's going to be very interesting uh, on how that is um, enforced on all those walkers from out of town, except for Stoneham that seems to follow the rules. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, that, Mr. Mayo. Um, and that does also bring us to the issue of, of enforcement. And I know that some towns and, and, and cities have uh, put in um, face covering policies before it became a statewide uh, re requirement. But when we're talking about things like restaurants and even retail, essential retail businesses, a lot of the, the responsibility seems to fall on, on our respective local uh, boards of health. And I'm, I'm curious to know what, what sort of um, responsibilities uh, or, or what sort of reactions you've, re you've been receiving from, from your, your board of health relative to that, because it seems like a lot of responsibility uh, is being shouldered by them and, and I would anticipate for, for the months to come. And it, it, it it's a lot for um, a board that you know isn't necessarily equipped or or you know um, uh, expected to have that that level of of incredible responsibility for such a, a duration of time. Has anyone had had any experience you know relative to that? I see no hands up. I, I will say that. Oh, um, Mr. Crawford, yes. Yeah, thanks, Ed. You know, just just to talk quickly about that. You know, the, obviously, the Board of Health is is uh, is under a tremendous uh, workload right now with with the uh, amount of positive cases. I, I don't know how our town, um, town of Linfield, compares to the neighboring towns as far as numbers of cases. But we, uh, our board of health is is one person. We also have a uh, emergency management team that's in place, probably like everyone else. And uh, our fire chief is our and our town administrator are the heads of that, and they're doing a tremendous job. Also, the 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 combination of the of the management team and the board of health together have, have uh, brunted most of the burden on this. And uh, you know, we I think as of this morning, the town of Linfield had uh, seventy seven positive cases since this began, we've had 11 deaths. So it's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a lot for a small town, obviously, and obviously one death's too many. But uh, that, that burden that falls on, not just the Board of Health, but, the, but our medical team is, uh, is taking its toll. And we've had uh, our public safety workers uh, been in quarantine and come back out. So there's, there's a lot going on with that. And, and, and I can't say enough about them and the tremendous job they've done. 
and uh, I'm, I'm sure uh, that would be echoed throughout each town. But it's it's been it's been quite a quite a ride so far, and uh, I really can't say enough about uh, the work they've done. So thanks. And uh, I'll turn it next to uh, uh, Chairman Doxer from Reading. Thanks, Ed. Just to uh, kind of reiterate some of the points Phil was making also, I think you know, we all have our, our response systems in place. Um, I think Regings is doing a, a, a tremendous job through a command structure. The Board of Health is under a lot of pressure to get stuff done. I was going to mention something a little bit different. One of the things that we've been trying to do with our select board meetings and other things is to make sure that we're able to broadcast a consistent message to the town in all the different ways that we possibly can. So clearly uh, articles coming out in the newspapers, things that are going online through Facebook, whatever, but making sure that at our select board meetings, we're taking time in the beginning to talk about what's happening. Um, once every few weeks, we'll go into a bit more depth, but each week just to kind of talk about what's happening, give the Board of Health an opportunity to share what's going on, allow for both board members and the public to ask questions if there are things that aren't clear. And, and since the thing has been Kind of spiraling with new activities you know each week or each two weeks i think it's been a pretty good way to share the information and again just make sure that we're getting consistent message out at all times i guess of, of this entire group um you know what are the sorts of considerations as you know them yet that are going to guide your decision making in terms of um policies in terms of use of open space or uh, allowing for you know, gatherings you know, in the future. Obviously not something to be happening next week, but in, in, in the months to come, has, has anyone given, given some thoughts to that in terms of what that looks like? I know, again, we'll be guided a lot by, by what, what the, the state you know, um, advises or perhaps mandates relative to that, but has anyone at, at the community level given, given some thoughts of what that would, may look like or what factors would be considered to get us to, to get your community to that point? So seeing no hands raised as of yet, it seems like perhaps that is something that I think I would anticipate all of us in, in, in the weeks. Oh, actually, yes. Um, this is Bob Lerlacher from Reading. Yes. Um, one of the things that Reading thought was really important is that the town and the schools do the same thing. Mm -hmm. So whatever the state may allow is one thing, but we want to make sure that in terms of summer programs, we're not doing different things. We have, you know, I've met three times this week with the superintendent just on this issue in terms of summer camp, summer programs. Um, probably all of you are mandated to run certain special ed activities for the summer, and that's the only thing we know is going to continue. But we just want to make sure that uh, both school and town are on the same page, if you will, uh, in terms of the community and, and sort of to reinforce Mark's you know, consistent message theme. Thank you for that. And certainly, and that, that is a big issue because we're, we're looking at, you know, I, I know we heard mention of Little League, but there are a lot of summer camps. And depending on what the um, the the expectations are with, with people working from home, um, summer camps often prepare, provide a lot of child care for, for families too. Um, and so has there has there been much discussion with anyone in terms of those, those issues, uh, your recreation departments, summer programming, camps and the like, has, has that come up as an issue? Does anyone have a sense of what direction your community might be heading in relative to that? Is it, is it too early? I'll turn it to I see, uh, Mr. Mayo from Wakefield. Sorry, <laughs> I'm muting myself. Um, well, it's not too early because now would be, or, or a few weeks ago was when we would have been um, you know, uh, registering for all these camps. So um, we're we're waiting for the guidance. We're thinking of it. We're we're considering things with the schools because we have a lot lot of crossover traditionally with um, school events, school run programs, and town run programs. So right now we're waiting for like everybody else waiting for that guidance. But I think we're all kind of thinking that there's not going to be a lot that's going to go on in these settings these summer. Uh, if something does, I think uh, that's something that this group could probably work with to see who can run what program, who can run another program. I think a lot of it will be contract-based uh, because we won't have the staff hired. We'll have to go to a, a, um, you know, a company that's already doing this, that already does sports camp. So I think that's something that we can have a follow-up on and consider. It's a good thing that we're together to talk about those things today. So, 
<coughs> it may be something where we, we end up as as communities or regionally, you know, decide that if there are activities that can happen safely, that perhaps one town picks up the basketball, you know, clinic, another town picks up, you know, the soccer program. And, and we, we have some kind of crossover between our communities so that each community isn't having to replicate all of the same offerings that they would do if we're at that point where that's even an option for us. So I think perhaps that's part of a lot of a, a broader discussion you know, we, we could certainly have as a group kind of going forward. Any other hands on what we've discussed so far? Seeing none. Um, restaurant? Oh, yeah. Yes, uh, Councilor Dinaco from Wakefield. Dennis Sheehan is trying to speak. I don't think many people know about the feature for raise the hand. They have, so oh. A lot of people are raising their hand physically, but they're not pressing the button. Oh, my, my apologies. Yes, there. Is, if you look at the bottom, um, you, you should see a raise hand option. And if you raise your hand that way, I, I, it comes up on my screen so I know to call on you. But with that, I'll turn to uh, Town Administrator Sheehan. Yeah, I think for, in terms of summer camps and summer programs, the two dates that everyone's obsessed over is the May 18th date um, and when the governor sort of gives guidance there. And then for a, a parent of two kids who are in, in daycare, the daycare date is really that later date in June that, you know, the, all the parents are kind of watching that date. And so what we hear in May about what will happen in June is really how we're kind of managing sort of summer camps. And so much of ours is contracted out that, you know, the vendors are constantly interested in how to prepare, so. Do we have any other hands either electronically or just waving? Yes, um, a select board member, uh, uh, Bachi. Hi, Ed, thanks. I'm, I'm curious if any one of any of the other towns have done any surveys um, on level of participation from parents for their children, because I know there's a lot of anxiety and a lot of stress out there, and we want to get the kids out of the house, but how do we do it safely? And if we open up a program, would it be overwhelming? Would it be underwhelming? Has anyone from any of the towns done any surveys? I don't think uh, we have, if Bob can hear me, if we've uh, done that for the rec department, but I'm just curious if there's any gauge of, uh, uh, you know, what people want to do. Have there been any surveys or is there even um, some, so, some anecdotal guidance that people are having? I know there are a lot of, you know, um, different polls that are coming out in terms of a comfort level of, of, of people generally in terms of going to restaurants and when they'd be ready to fly again and things of that nature, obviously not at the most local of levels. Has, does anyone have a, a sense of where your community is at with that through you know, communications or discussions you may have had with anyone? I do think that it's, it is an important question and, I, and I'm, I'm not sure it's one that we necessarily have an answer to as of yet in a lot of our communities. But, but I think it's something that it's going to be a consideration I, I expect we're all going to be, be uh, factoring in for any decisions we're making going forward. Ed, I believe Rainy Parker's raising her hand. Yeah, yes, I don't, uh, I don't, I don't know how to raise my hand. Uh, no worries, I'll just keep scrolling. But, uh, so Vice Chair Parker from Stoneham, yes. So I, I guess for me, it's a little bit different because I've been involved with youth sports for a long time and um, the schools, you know, PTO, I think a lot of parents that I talk to personally, especially those of young children, are a little bit leery of sending their kids out right now. Um, they are dying to get them together with their friends and, um, you know, get them back out to playing and, and doing sports. And with the nice weather coming, it's challenging. But I, I, for me personally, from the people that I've talked to, I don't feel that their fears are lifted yet. And I think we just still have to wait and see what the governor says um, as far as mandating anything. You know, the conversations we have with our rec department are what, what can we offer besides physical? You know, I've had this conversation with our rec director, like what else can we do to get creative, whether it's, you know, online stuff or, um, you know, virtual stuff. So we're trying to think outside the box, but I, I 
for me personally, I don't think the parent comfort level is there yet. So that's just my experience. Thank you for that. It's a really important perspective. And with that, I see that we also have a select board uh, uh, chair, Mark uh, Dosser, who is, had his hand raised as well. Sorry, then I, then I dropped it. I just was, um, was going to add the, the one thing that our Board of Health has been talking about is thinking about doing whatever planning is possible, figuring out the kinds of things that are likely to flood in. So as you talk about whether it's a sporting activity or a restaurant opening or whatever they are, there'll be a flood of activity that's going to take place. And I think we're all in the same situation where when that happens, the, the boards will be overwhelmed. So one of the things is trying to see if there are any things that you can kind of line up in advance, you know, checklists, if you will, making sure that paperwork is, is ready so that once there is an, an opportunity when the governor gives kind of a go ahead, that there'd be a chance to, to kind of start it in, in the most orderly fashion possible. Indeed, yes. And that's something you're working on in, in Reading currently? Yes, so both Board of Health and actually the um, the command team as well. Thank you. I see uh, Councillor Chines from Wakefield has his hand up as well. Uh, thanks, Ed, and, and thank you everyone for uh, for being on. Uh, you know, I, I just uh, thinking about the question of what happens with some of the summer programs. I think one of the big variables that we face is what happens on the employer side. Um, you know, one of the things that I think. You know, we're struggling with in the company that I work for and I've heard from other folks is when do employers start to bring people back to work and part of that's predicated on what the governor does but part of that's also predicated on what are their policies across the country what is the level of comfort what are the accommodations that they have and I think as we think about planning for the summer in our communities a lot of what we do is going to be dependent on that you know do people need child care um, you know and if, if that's the case um, you know, I think we might see more of a, uh, an impact on some of our summer programs than, than if not. Unfortunately, I just don't think we have a lot of good answers to that yet, certainly in, in Wakefield and I, I would guess in almost all of our communities. But I think that's something that we've got to be thinking about and planning for so that to the extent that we can help, um, you know, our families and our parents who might be uh, heading back to work in June, July, that we're ready to do so. Thank you for that. And certainly uh, some of that work may, may very well involve uh, restaurants. And um, it, that's obviously a big issue, I know, for, for many of our communities. Uh, many restaurants now are offering the, the takeout option. Some restaurants are, in fact, closed. But it, it seems all signaling is that when restaurants are allowed to reopen for seated diners, uh, it's going to be at lim more limited capacity. And so a restaurant that may have 100 people, 100 person capacity, might be at 50, 50 people. So. Um, you know, I think some of what what goes into the considerations is, is is there a way that we can help these businesses still, but preserving social distancing. And I know that so, there's been some discussion already about things like, can you expand, for example, outdoor seating somewhere? So perhaps into a parking lot, or if there's a neighboring lot you know, or, or lawn next door where a restaurant could still potentially achieve its 100 person capacity for its own viability, but also preserve the, the social distancing, which obviously is so important as well. Have any of your communities been through those sorts of discussions yet? Um, is, has, have you heard much from, from um, the business community relative to that? Hello? Yes. How you doing? Hey. Anthony Cogliano, Port, uh, Chip, Port of Selection Chairman from Saugus. I just had this conversation tonight with the uh, Wong family from Kowloon. They, as you know, if we do get to the point where we're going to start opening up again, obviously their capacity is going to be cut substantially. So I just talked with them and their attorney tonight about extending their seating out into the parking lot. They do have an outside area, but they won't even go further, cut their capacity in half, but have double the seats outside so they're spaced out. So that's something we just talked about tonight, but it certainly sounds like a good idea moving forward. I'm sure we're gonna see other places wanna do the same. And are we seeing like, that, that's, that's 
incredible time, incredibly timely. Um, have we seen that with other communities too? I, I, like Linfield comes to mind with Market Street specifically. I know that there's a lot of opportunity there, uh, you potentially. But I think all of us in our communities can probably think of you know a few restaurants at least that have the potential to do that. You know, be it maybe set up a tent, you know, be it just outdoor seating in a parking lot, um, things of that nature. Have other communities run into this yet, or has there been much thought given to it? Uh, Ed, it's Rob Dolan from Linfield. Yeah, tomorrow uh, we are meeting with um, the Market Street Management to talk about restaurants, to talk about setup. Um, and uh, you know, one of the restaurant owners is on the governor's committee uh, for reopening, the owner of uh, Davio's. And, and there seems to be a, a pretty consistent uh, information come out of the restaurant community that it's going to be a stress, uh, a priority to open more outside seating, which also... Uh, brings into the liquor laws in terms of uh, uh, of those issues, but so I'm hoping I'm hoping that the governor provides and the committee provides some very clear uh, guidelines and some special legislation, if necessary, uh, to open up what for Linfield is is the is uh, the backbone of our very small commercial base. Right, certainly, and 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 that that is the issue. I mean, the ABCC we're looking at it. They're talking about a footprint. You know, basically, and it's normally just the brick and mortar location. Um, so the idea of, you know, perhaps even regionally, if we find that this is a, an issue for a number of our communities, you know, reaching out to our respective delegations that, you know, as a region um, for these sorts of e exemptions, given the circumstances, I think would be something that would be really important for us to all, you know, um, continue a dialogue on. Anyone else um, running into similar issues or? Having other creative ideas, I know a lot of restaurants. If, if they if they're at twenty five percent capacity, for example, they they can't make the numbers work, and so they have to figure out how to safely get to to their capacity numbers. All right, well, seeing nothing further on that, um, I'll move so, uh, along to the next piece, and and that's actually item number three, and, and that's and you had a couple yeah. of hands up, but I think uh, Jen from Melrose and Paul. Oh, my apologies. All right, so we'll begin first with uh, City Councilor from Melrose. Hi, thank you. I'm Jen Grigoritis. I'm the Ward 6 City Councilor and the current Council President. Um, and obviously, we have a slightly different structure in our in our government than you all do. Um, but around the opening of businesses, Mayor Broder formed an economic development task force that consists of representatives of the Council, his administration, the local Chamber of Commerce, and several business owners. And we've met twice. And one of the things that's currently before us is this idea of reopening how do we use outdoor space? How do we look at our current regulations to allow public space to be used for retail? I know Assembly Row at some, in Somerville is looking into doing outdoor markets where they're gonna let um, both retail and restaurants um, sell outdoors. And the other request that we've had from community members that we're considering is dedicated curbside pickup parking in our downtown. Um, to your earlier point, assuming that restaurants are gonna be operating at reduced capacity and there might be hesitation on the part of the public to go in, how do we make that easier for people in the long term? So, and I believe we have a survey going out, I think tomorrow to the business community. Got it. Thank you. So it'll be interesting to see what those results um, turn out. Any other um, communities on that? Do we have any other hands raised? Um, I see uh, Councillor Donaco from Wakefield. Mr. Chair, I'm going to uh, withdraw my hand. Okay, thank, thank you. you. So uh, we'll, we'll keep moving on then to the next um, item, and that is uh, the handling of, of town meetings, elections, and, lo and large public gatherings. I know that each of us has, has a somewhat different structure. Some of us are representative town meeting, others are not. Um, and we also have um, the city council structure, obviously, which, which is different. So uh, how are communities, and, and as I understand it, um, legislation allows for representative town meeting to participate remotely. Do I have that correct for those communities? I see head nods, yes. Um, so for those those communities that have town meeting that uh, that are open to all, uh, has there been discussion about what what that may look like or what steps you, you'd be looking to, to take in the coming coming months or weeks, I suppose? And uh, uh, Mr. Crawford. Yeah, that's obviously a big challenge right now with what's going on and the fact that you can't have large groups get together. We um, our, our uh, moderator actually proposed doing a um, 
a town meeting in the parking lot in your car. I'm not sure how, how that would happen or what that would look like, but that was uh, the only way to, um, under the current structure, to make that happen. Uh, we also have a quorum requirement, which is a, a challenge. Uh, the, this current legislation in front of the uh, in the House right now uh, that would allow the select boards to reduce the quorum requirement. So they, we may have a meeting or we have the ability to have a meeting within uh, one of our buildings uh, and have some social distancing going on at the same time. You can spread out a certain number of seats and, and run a town meeting with a, a much lower quorum and still get your, your budget approved and in, in, in your, um, in your work that you need to get done before July 1st. Uh, of course, we still have the ability to go past July 1st, but if we could get it done before then, it would certainly make life a lot easier. So again, that's going to be based on what happens in the next two or three weeks. Uh, I, I believe that's going to change. And when is your town meeting set to, to open? Uh, we just extended it out to June 20th. Okay. So you're, you're already pretty close to that July 1 date. <clears throat> Correct. With the current scheduling. Right. 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 And other communities um, dealing with this issue? Do I see any more hands? Ann Landry has her hand. Yes. Ed. Yes. I see um, Ann Landry. Yes, good evening. Good evening. I apologize for not locating the virtual raise hand no option. Worries. <laughs> um, we are, we're also, we'll be revisiting this question on May 27th as the Reading Select Board. Um, we'd previously postponed our town meeting to mid-June. Uh, we do expect the legislature to pass a bill allowing for remote participation in town meeting. We have a uh, representative town meeting. It's, I think, part of that same piece of legislation that's in the House that would allow for a reduction in quorum requirements. And I expect that will happen soon. Uh, and then we will be um, discussing how to handle town meeting uh, remotely or to, to further delay uh, on May 27th. Although I think we had talked seriously about how really it will be ideal to uh, at least get the budget done in June before the end of the fiscal year. And we have a task force um, that our chair, Mark Doxer, is working on to, to examine how to handle town meeting. Thank you. And I would imagine the consensus of, of everyone here tonight is, is uh, each community is, is looking to have a budget by June 30th. Is, is that the general sentiment of, of everyone? Are there any communities that are, that are looking to push that out beyond June 30? Or is it, I see a lot of head shaking, no. Uh, yes, um, uh, Town Administrator Sheehan. Um, so Stoneham does have open town meeting with no quorum requirement, so it is a challenge uh, in, in that regard. We are planning for both paths uh, at this point and have presented a series of dates. So, you know, each day is so different that it's been hard to exactly predict how to roll anything out. So we are operating on both paths in terms of an interim budget as well as an annual budget so that everyone knows about the possibility of it happening. And I see um, Mr. Mayo from Wakefield as well. Oh, I actually didn't have my hand up. <laughs> oh, that was an old one. <laughs> but I think we're, we're, we're under the same boat and um, uh, talked a lot with the moderator too, because technically, you know, he, he now has the ability to move town meetings since it's been set and the warrant has been approved. Um, I do not want to go with a 112 budget. I don't think there's any town uh, manager or administrator or mayor that wants to do that um, through, through my discussions with them. So um, we do have a precedent of having an outdoor um, town council meeting. So we may have an outdoor um, uh, town meeting as well. So we'll um, kind of waiting to look through that. And we'll just hope for some good weather if that's yep. the case. Indeed. All right, so uh, with that, then I'll move on to the next item, which is uh, managing various boards, committees, commissions, uh, their meetings, and, and also preserving, but um, encouraging at the same time, public participation. Obviously, uh, things are very different for all of us. And um, 
I'm interested in 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 the perspectives of, of the other communities. You know, how are how are you getting the business of, of your town or city done? Are you are your boards and committees and commissions meeting? Are you having public hearings? Uh, how has that been going? What, what have you been finding have been some of the challenges or perhaps some of the advantages um, in in that? And and how are you incorporating in public uh, participation and public comment to to the work you're doing these days? Anthony Cogliano. Yeah. Good evening. Uh, we, we started the Zoom meetings. We've, we've had uh, two Board of Selectmen's meetings on Zoom. I know the school committee's meeting on it. And we haven't had any problems. I, I was very worried when we first started how it, how it was all going to work. But we've had no problems. We've had good uh, public interaction. Um, anyone that's wanted to speak on the issue, if they couldn't get through on Zoom, I had them call my cell phone. So we've really had no issues whatsoever. We've moving forward all the time. So I would love to get back to a situation where we can meet in public again, but uh, this is the best we get, so we deal with it. Certainly, indeed. Um, I see that we also have a select board chair, a, a doctor as well, who has his hand up from Reading. Oh, I, I didn't, but I'm, I'm happy to. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we've been um, using Zoom. I think it's working pretty well. We've been meeting weekly. This will be the first week we won't have met in, I think, four. Um, and um, we've had public comment coming in through email, actually. Um, so public comment um, toward the beginning of the meeting and then um, issue specific during the meeting. But I'm very interested in hearing how other people are handling, handling that as well. It's been um, difficult, I think, where usually in, in, a, in a meeting, people are able to speak with their own voice, obviously, and, and stand up and be recognized versus um, somehow having somebody else read the message is a little bit different. Um, I'm very interested in how other people are, are working with that. Well, I can speak on, on, on the Wakefield side just briefly that we have, um, I, I guess we were early adopters in terms of uh, the Zoom technology back, back in March. And we had been having some discussion at the town council level, probably town councils was a, a, a month or two prior about the idea of, of potentially allowing for remote participation. So that had been a discussion that had, had been started already. The, uh, the pandemic obviously forced it um, before us you know, to make some, you know, to make some uh, deci decisions at that point. And um, it seems to be, from, a, from Wakefield's perspective, I think it's been going incredibly well. Uh, we have been able to do the business of the town. The town council has been able to, to meet and, and, and uh, hold its meetings as we normally would. I'm not aware of any committees, commissions, or boards that have, have not been, including things like the, the ZBA, you know, in, in their adjudicatory capacity, being able to have a public meeting. And that has worked quite well. Um, we, I believe in Mr. Mayo University are using Zoom across the board for all of our meetings. We uh, print all of the um, login information on the agendas for these meetings. So everyone, any member of the public is allowed to, as they are even this evening, allowed to sit through and, and, and listen in real time to what is being discussed. Certainly when there are public meetings that um, members of the public are allowed to speak, you know, certain points, we, we, we open that up for discussion. We also allow uh, emails to be submitted through a, a portal and we even allow a Dropbox outside of our town hall so that if anyone is looking to offer a public comment and perhaps they don't have access to the internet, they can submit that and then those are uh, retrieved and then read at the beginning of, of our meetings. So I, I think overall we've, we've had surprisingly good success in being able to streamline a lot of our processes despite the fact that we have a very different form to do it. Um, I see that we have um, Vice Chair Parker uh, from Reading as well with her hand up. Uh, Okay, I'm sorry, my apologies. Uh, sorry. Stone, um, so we've had a couple of um, select board meetings via, um, we're using uh, the GoToMeeting platform. And one of the first meetings we did, we had a public hearing and we, we had a call-in number um, and we designated, you know, a five minute window for people to call in. Nobody called in. Um, uh, and then at another meeting, there were people who uh, logged into the meeting but didn't participate. Um, we're trying to figure out right now, um, I believe our secretary is setting up a, a public comment email uh, address for people to send in if they have any questions that we could answer 
um, you know, beforehand um, or, or during our meeting, answer their questions by the, by the internet here, <laughs> whatever we're calling this. Um, so, you know, we usually have a, a segment on our agendas for public comment, which we haven't been including right now. Um, but I think this is probably a way that we're going to be able to hear from the public a little bit more, um, whether it's email or call in. And if you give, you know, for hearings per se, you might want to give like a five minute window for, for a call in. So it sounds like that's that continues to develop in Stona then the the optionality there. Okay. And I see we also have um, Melrose City Council President uh, Greg Goratis as well with her hand up. Thank you. Um, so the city of Melrose is also using WebEx, which we were able to leverage through our existing contract with Cisco. So it was no additional cost and thankfully has been relatively free of the Zoom bombers. That has been a challenge um, that many of us have read about and hopefully not experienced. Um, I think it took us a little bit to get up and running, but we have pretty much all of our boards and commissions along with the school committee and the council meeting via WebEx on our regular schedule. Um, Similarly to Stoneham, we're allowing people to submit uh, public comment to us in advance via email to let us know that they wish to speak live and our city clerk is able to pull them up as attendees into the meeting. And then we also pause a little bit to see who wants to participate. Um, I think one challenge for us has been, we haven't been able to live stream the WebEx through our cable access station. So we are concerned that we're missing some of our older constituents who aren't as comfortable with um, WebEx or may not have the technology at home to access, but we are able to get the meetings rebroadcast. So I think it's working and I think in some ways it's allowed people to who maybe couldn't come down to City Hall at seven o'clock at night to, um, per, to participate from the comfort of their home. Thank you for that. And, and you're finding that it sounds like by and large you're having good success with, with what you have in place currently. Yeah, I think it's really worked and I think it's a, a real testament to our IT department and our city clerk's office. They've really been very hands-on in managing the meetings for us, which we really appreciate. I think certainly all of, all of um, our communities that have community access television and um, committed IT departments, and I know that I probably speak for all of us when we, we thank them for that because it, this can't happen without them. You know, uh, it's it's so incredibly important. Even what we're doing this evening, our our community access you know, station WCAT. Without them, we couldn't do this. You know, they they are just incredible partners in all of this. Um, I see that we have town administrator Mr. Mayo with his hand up as well. I, I would be um, interested to know how um, some of the other um, communities um, have felt that their public hearings have gone a little bit different than a public meeting, but a public hearing where it's not just public participation, but it's actually people that are discussing um, on a project, land use project, or what have you. Um, you know, we are running through Zoom. It's it's done extremely well. Um, thank you to our clerk and our IT department for setting this up. We can hold multiple Zoom meetings um, with multiple um, committees. Um, I have actually um, attended via Zoom a number of um, uh, of these public hearings. You know, the zoning board had one, and it's been great with the screen share model. And there were members of the public that questioned, questioned the plan, and I thought it went very well. Our zoning, our planning board actually uh, had public hearings on um, a number of zoning articles that are going to our town meeting, part of the process, and that has worked very well. As has our conservation commission. Town council held a public hearing on a um, an underground storage tank license that needed to have. So I've been very pleased with it. And I do want to echo our WCAT, our, our local cable has done a fabulous job. And in a strange way, um, I think these uh, meetings are actually more accessible to the public because if I'm not mistaken, every one of them is, um, is videoed and every one of them uh, for every committee is then um, broadcast on our website, um, maybe delayed in some instances, but um, Certainly, the school committee and the um, town council are, are are being on direct. So I, I think that's worked really well. But I'd love to hear some from some of the other um, communities on how their public hearings went, because not everyone is doing them. And I'd be interested to see if anybody had any issues that, um, you know, I'll say this, then we'll have a problem with the public hearing next week. So maybe this will help us get ahead of the curve. Are there other communities? Yes. Um, uh, Saugus. 
Yes. We've had uh, we've had several public hearings, and most of them have gone smooth. Uh, we we allow the public comment. Um, similar situation, they just raise their hand and uh, take their questions. We do have a couple of hot button issues coming up on the nineteenth of May, so uh, it'll be interesting to see how many people line up to oppose some of the. Uh, we have one new entertainment complex coming into town, and a an issue with a uh, car dealer that the neighbors don't want. So I'm sure it'll be very exciting fielding all those calls. But so far, so good. We've allowed public comment on everything. We have a, a public comment halfway through the meeting and another one uh, right, at, right at the end. So we've had a lot of uh, back and forth with the community. Thank you. Thank you. And I think uh, we next have a comment from Linfield as well. Um, Blue Loucher. That's Redding, that's me. My apologies. Um, in Redding, um, our conservation uh, commission has had a couple of continued public hearings uh, and they've gone fine. They've had no problem. Um, they've not yet started any new hearings. Um, partly, and, and our other main land use boards, uh, planning and ZBA have really shown no appetite to want to have public hearings. Um, none of the boards are dealing with issues right now where the applicants are in any sense of an urgent hurry. So we've been fortunate in not having any zoning articles or things like that um, with a timeline. And um, in Reading, the select board is going to discuss having a public hearing policy, you know, uh, a formal policy, although perhaps an emergency one and temporary one, because we are concerned, especially with some of the land use boards, about what happens when someone looks back and has somehow, you know, claimed they've been denied access to a uh, to a proceeding. So we we've uh, engaged our town council, and uh, the board will be seeing a draft policy so that all the land use boards, especially, are protected. Thank you. Thank you for that. And. I guess wrapping up the, this this topic, then uh, I'll move on to our next, which is is number five, which has really been I think mostly covered by some of our discussion already. Uh, I'll just say that I know that Melrose identified the economic development task force that that has recently been been convened. Are there other communities that are doing similar things to think about how to best support our local businesses as we um, look to you know. Um, have this 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 rolling uh, reentry into the economy? I see no hands as of yet, so it sounds. Oh, actually, I see two hands. I'm sorry. Uh, I'll, I'll turn it first to um, uh, Councilor Smith Galvin of Wakefield. Thank you, and I was just going to follow up on that. I'd be curious to hear what the other towns have in terms of um, existing economic development directors um, or paid staff doing that and how you see their role going forward. Couldn't, now, do we have um, communities that do have existing economic development directors or someone in, in a comparable role or having comparable responsibilities? And, and, and what has their role been? How do you see it changing? Some hands up that predate the, that question, but uh, I'll turn it over to Reddick. Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, our, our economic development director's job has changed quite a bit in the last two months. I think she's far more busy now. Um, she's working pretty closely with the Chamber of Commerce that we share with North Reading. So, for instance, they have discussed and worked on a restaurant opening and having more outdoor dining. Uh, what are the liquor license implications, as, as Steve mentioned earlier? Um, so we're finding a very collaborative atmosphere among our restaurants. Many of them are very small mom and pop restaurants uh, in terms of our downtown area. <laughs> so the uh, paid staff, as it were, is very, very engaged and active in this area. We, we are trying to re retain as many uh, small businesses as we can. And are there particular challenges that you're finding from those small businesses? Obviously, there's a great deal of uncertainty, which we all know, but are you, are you hearing anything in particular, their, what their biggest concerns are going forward? They're very concerned about the safety of their customers and their staff. That's mm -hmm. the wild card that none of us have really great answers for. Um, obviously, economically, they're challenged, but I, I think most of them are a little more concerned about 
uh, the health issues over the economics. And if I could just piggyback on that for yeah, a second. Of course. Um, so Mark Doxer from, from Reading as well, just piggybacking what, on what Bob was saying, the, um, the Board of Health and Command staff have uh, started to put together a plan to help when it's time to open restaurants and things, kind of how to do it. So deciding um, where priorities will, will take place, uh, getting some extra help. Uh, the fire is doing a lot of inspections and a few other things right now to help um, so that you know the Board of Health is setting you know, where they have to go first, typically to, to some of the closed locations. But just starting to do some planning so that when there is the opportunity to move ahead, we know what we want to do and we have a plan that we can start to implement directly. Good. And I see that we also have Councillor at Large uh, from Melrose, uh, uh, Jack Eccles. So, so Councillor Eccles. I don't, I don't think I raised my hand. Uh, oh, oh. All right, fair enough. All right, so moving on then beyond um, this issue, there are obviously issues of, of how we deal with things like um, curfews and, and any sort of um, decisions that we may be making as, as municipalities as compared with what with, with the state may be mandating for us or perhaps you know offering us some guidance on. So maybe, if we could just survey the, those participating here, are there are there certain um, criteria that that you expect you'll be using in in making those decisions about you know whether you your community may be say more restrictive, for example, than what the the state may allow in terms of uh, reopening, perhaps hours or or um, capacity issues and those sorts of things. And what would be the drivers? Would it be your Board of Health recommendations? Would it be you know, task, for, task force, uh, forces that you've set up? Um, your executive you know, bodies? What, what's, what would be the, the, the driving determinants there? Ed? Yes. If you don't mind, I, I, um, you know, we certainly have a, a large concentration of stores and restaurants at Market Street, and and uh, like like the other towns, we have some small mom and pops around the town. But the the Market Street, uh, as our town administrator said earlier, we're going to meet with them tomorrow to see where they stand and what their thoughts are. But a lot of it's going to be gauged on what the ABCC will allow and what our uh, Board of Health will allow. Uh, and, and of course, the guidance that we're going to get will, will probably be restrictive in, in nature in the first place. Uh, we have we have some curfews and and certain restrictions on the Market Street entity that's different from the rest of the town already. And I think what we'll probably be looking at is, is some sort of adjustment to that, depending on what is allowed, because they've already asked on how much, how big of an outdoor uh, seating area can they be allowed to to create. And then if, if you're familiar with the complex, uh, you'd be shutting off streets. And is this going to be allowed by the ABCC? Is it going to be allowed by our Board of Health? You know, all those things are still up in the air. And, of course, it all, it's all governed on, on uh, when we open back up. But, uh, you know, as you know, and, and people that are in business, you, you can't open up a restaurant and, and at 20% capacity, 30% capacity. It's not even worth opening. So it has to be something that uh, makes sense, uh, even open inside. And, and then obviously we'd like to provide some outdoor seating if that's going to make it economically feasible for them to open. Uh, we, we're still very curious on how many uh, restaurants and shops are going to reopen in general uh, in the long run. And it's, it's very, we're very curious. The mom and pop places in town, have, have, we've, we've always uh, pushed – to, to frequent those and do the takeout. And, and I, you know, my family does, I know all the other families do around here. It's a small town. We all, we all know the owners very well and, and they've, they've been doing a pretty brisk business. So it's, so we've been trying to, uh, uh, you know, go to our local, you know, stores and, and, uh, and restaurants, but, um, uh, I'll be curious what happens uh, with the, the bigger development up there. That'll be interesting, but we'll certainly support what they need to open and be viable. That's what it's, it's, it's important to our town. It's important to everybody that works there. 
And it's certainly, uh, I'm curious on how the staffing model is going to look. I'm, I'm sure they're going to have trouble staffing at any kind of uh, capacity, near full capacity. So it's, it's a big challenge for everybody. Thanks. I do think, I think too, as a region, the idea of curfews and, and last call and the like, at least in the short term, it will, will matter because we don't want to create a situation whereby we have patrons just migrating from one town to the next because of, you know, very different, um, you know, um, times in place. So I think that's probably a discussion that we can continue to have as we have some more guidance from, from the governor um, on, on where we're headed in the months to come, certainly. Um, moving on to agenda number six, if I don't see any other hands up, I don't believe I do. Uh, item number six is sharing of best practices or lessons learned thus far. I, I know this is, has been a trial by fire for, for all of our communities, certainly. Um, but are there any things that, that you've learned thus far as, as a municipality uh, that you'd like to share? Or um, any lessons that, that, that you, you may be taking with you now as you're making future decisions as we continue to navigate through the pandemic? Any communities? Ed, that's yes. Rob Dole. You know, yes, I've always yes. known this, but what I have been particularly um, uh, been made clearer to me is the professionalism of the vast majority of staff that we have been able to from home uh, in, in such a in Linfield, which is a, basically the management consists of myself in terms of the, the top level. Uh, Department heads have taken upon themselves to be creative and line employees have come in uh, to make sure the job gets done. Uh, so the idea that the world will change now uh, as it pertains to flexibility of work, um, where people can do their jobs, does everyone have to come to town hall all the time? Uh, they've proven to me uh, that they are responsible professionals uh, that not when given the tools to have, you know, to display ideas and to implement them, have, have done it without even, in some cases, notifying me within their own circles. Many of the departments have actually met, uh, be it by phone or, or Zoom on their own, uh, be it uh, the, the, the Council on Aging who took it upon themselves, amongst three people, to call 1,500 people every 10 days to see how they're doing. Um, if someone needs to go shopping, uh, I know in Melrose, uh, my mother has been called several times, a, a senior citizen, whether she needs help. Uh, even our library that hasn't been open, and, and I don't know when it will open again, has taken upon themselves on the internet to create a, a, a large pool of, of opportunity to continue to learn at, at every age. So the, the idea of structure in towns and in cities is often rigid and, and, and kind of so basically sometimes uh, oppresses creativity and freedom. And in some cases, people have been able to rise to this challenge even at a town hall uh, where the rules or the union contracts sometimes, you know, put a damper on that. So the Seeing, seeing the positive, certainly, and and I think we're seeing a lot of that um, in many of our communities. Um, Councilor uh, or Vice Chair Santos from Wakefield. Um, I would echo everything Rob said about having such joy in the professionalism um, of our workers as well. I think something that um, we seem to have been doing okay, but is is definitely important is to have consistent messaging from all the departments. So if Board of Health is saying something and town um our town council is a little bit off or certain departments are i really think that sends confusing messages when none of us know what's happening and the um, news is so fluid so i think for best practices really understanding that you have to have one voice and i think someone from reading mentioned this pushing that out wherever you can pushing that out to whatever platform you're using is very um important for our citizens to hear that one voice. And I think it gives some confidence in um, at the municipal level that we may not be feeling at another level, perhaps. Thank you. Certainly, thank you. Um, I see Councilor at large from Melrose, uh, uh, Jack Eccles, hand up. Hey, so so to, in response to um, Rob Dolan from Winfield, to just talk a little bit about what we're doing in Melrose, we've set up a volunteer network called Melrose Helps. 
So there's a city employee who has probably a little bandwidth right now because she's in charge of our bookings for Memorial Hall, which is obviously closed. Um, and so she's been coordinating distribution for anything. And then we have a field, many volunteers, I don't know the exact number. And then all the counselors were made team captains. And so we coordinate on a weekly basis to check in with the volunteers to make sure that the calls are happening. Um, and we basically call people until they opt out. If they don't opt out, they get a weekly check-in. And then, so we take down notes of anything that they might need. And then um, that's submitted to sort of a centralized distribution of help that they might need, that they can then get. What sort of response are you finding from the from residents? Um, I, as anyone who's ever picked up a phone and called strangers before, a lot of opt outs. But then there's, you know, I think that we all, I think we all end up with a few volunteers that have some opt-ins and then they do weekly check-ins, whether it's just getting information about city services um, or, you know, I've, I've had one of my volunteers tell me that, that one of her, you know, the people she calls just likes to talk, which I think is a helpful thing too. Um, but then there's some grocery orders as well. So that, that, that's a real benefit to a lot of folks who otherwise would be without there. Thank you for that. Do we have anyone else with a hand raised? I'm seeing none. So with then. Ed, Ed? Yeah, yes. Um, so I'm curious, yeah. Carlo from Reading. I'm yes. just curious on um, if anyone wants to comment on the in, in any of the towns and cities about using reverse 911 or code red for getting information out. Has everyone done that? Have you not done it? I'm just curious. Are there any communities that are not using code red or, or something similar for a reverse non non one call? Are all six of us doing that? Wakefield is, I can say. It appears every everyone else is um, some version of that, certainly. And how how have people been finding that as as a communications tool so far? Carla, have you had much of a reaction from residents? Sorry, I, I we've, we've done several, and you know, I, I and I, I don't, I'm not, I don't get any complaints. I happen to be the secretary of the board. We're not, we don't overwhelm anyone, and uh, I, I think um, you know, don't need to uh, call for no reason. It has to be something important or a brand new ordinance that we had. That we like the mask ordinance that. Ann spoke about earlier. Um, that was a, a call, and and there was another call. I obviously forget what it was, um, but you know, with the guidance coming from the governor, that made me an another call just to inform all the residents. Not everyone's on Facebook. Um, not everyone gets the paper, uh, you know, in social media and, and, and other forms. Not everyone goes to the town website. We have a nice red banner on our town website for COVID nineteen at the very top with a lot of resources. Um, and I, I'm new to the board, but I've been here for about 11 years in the town of Reading. And I want to commend our command staff, uh, who's been outstanding. We have our fire chief uh, calling all the senior housing complexes several times a week to see what they need, uh, for PPE. Um, we have a lot of volunteers um, calling upon people and just supporting our local restaurants and businesses that are open. And um, I can only say positive things about that. I mean, it's having the command staff uh, enacted early on by Bob and Chief of Police and, and the Fire Chief was, I think, a great uh, move, and it served us well. Uh, and, and, and hopefully we can get rid of it soon, but I think uh, it's going to be needed for a while and um, until we get to some sense of normalcy, and this may be the new normal for a while uh, virtually, but I know, as uh, Mark said, our town meeting uh, agenda at the end of the month will be a big one in how we uh, resolve that and try to keep that date in mid-June or extend it uh, another week to try to get it done uh, for the fiscal year. I think it will be interesting to see what what new ways of communicating or connecting remain in place even after the pandemic has passed because I think we're we're being all being quite creative in, in how we're reaching out to people so that'll be interesting. Um, I see Vice Chair uh, Parker from uh, Stoneham has her hand up as well. Yeah, I just wanted to comment on um, Rob's last comment about um, how creative uh, our employees have um, 
been with spending and flexing with their schedules, but also coming up with really new um, great ideas that could be coming down the road, maybe, Dennis, if he'll let us. But, um, <laughs> you know, we've set up a, a, an emergency command center, we'll call it, um, where it's at the senior center and some of our department heads, uh, you know, our, our rec department, our um, community planner, the senior center director, our, um, who else is in there? Our, our community addiction coordinator. They, they've all been tasked to that department, to that senior house and their food shopping for seniors, um, you know, making phone calls for mental, uh, mental checks to make sure everybody's okay. Um, and it's a small group, but they've done a tremendous amount of work. And um, it just goes to show how different departments really can come together and work together collaboratively. And they're still doing their regular jobs, but they're, I, I don't know, I, I think, I think it gives everybody a pause to see what all the other departments do and figure out ways to work better together, um, if you will. So uh, there's, you know, great stuff happening, um, you know, especially with regard to our senior population. Um, uh, we're, we're proud of the job that, I'm proud of the job that everybody's doing here in Stone. So that's great. That's great to hear. Certainly, I, I think that the amount of outreach is is so important too. It sounds like some of the committees are doing a lot of that, especially with our with our senior population, um, which you know has gone from being able to have socialization at the senior center, or, you know, with neighbors to potentially feeling quite isolated. So I think we're we're all very cognizant of that, which is important. Um, I see that we have another comment from. Uh, Councilor at Large, uh, Migliora, Migliorelli uh, from, <laughs> from the race. Yes. Um, just wanted to follow up on the, the phone calling. So, uh, most of the emergency communications come from our mayor's office, and um, we use uh, Everbridge, which is the platform that allows us to. Um, to call and update residents, residents uh, to help supplement our mayor's videos. He does an online daily video um, on Facebook and it's posted on our website. And um, we've noticed that over time that our open and listen rates have significantly improved. Um, and it's just, it's been a good tool, another follow-up tool, especially to reach people who are not on social media, which I feel like is, is the biggest challenge I, I think we're finding is that you, you know, you can't, Pump, bump into people on the streets anymore and, and have these conversations or at events. And so your your communication channels have gotten significantly narrowed. So um, that's another tool that we use in Melrose. Thank you for that. Um, I do see that we have a Facebook Live question that's come through. Um, I'll, I'll just answer it because it's a pretty easy one. It, it would be apparently someone from, from Wakefield who was asking, with the mask delivery starting tomorrow, will they be leaving them in mailboxes or will they be ringing our doorbells? Um, masks will not be left in, in mailboxes. They will be um, left in, in doorways and uh, their bells will be rung or, or um, there will be a knock at your door. So anyone from Wakefield, um, that's how they'll be delivered. Um, the next item on the, the agenda was just to at least introduce the or begin the discussion of, of benefits of regionalization. Uh, one of one of the goals that that I, that I see with this is is it provides us with an opportunity, you know, um, in any number of ways. But one of them could be buying power and, and look at face masks, for example, uh, and perhaps not the best example. Um, but you know, if that was something where we had several communities who were perhaps perhaps interested in in securing a good number of face masks, uh, we could perhaps. You know, look to do that and get get them get them at a better price point. I know um, after this meeting was convened, um, there had been a, a news story I think over the weekend that talked about uh, I think it was seven the seven different uh, northeastern states who were able to uh, band together uh, for PPE and to be able to uh, purchase that you know have better buying power basically. And so while I don't know to what extent we can do that during this pandemic, 
it certainly looks to present an opportunity for all of us going forward. I know that we're all expecting you know, um, le uh, leaner budgets, um, less less state aid, uh, lower local receipts, and so we're going to be needing to look at ways that we can you know collaboratively work together and, and figure out how we can get the most bang for for you know, our, our taxpayer dollars um, with that. So you know, uh, I guess it's more kind of an open question uh, where people stand with you know the idea of 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 moving forward with with this idea of looking to, to explore regional approaches um, you, when we have those sorts of issues and also things like advocacy i know that several of you have mentioned um, the issue of restaurant capacity and how we can safely expand that capacity to keep those businesses afloat we all have our respective delegations um, at the state house but if we together as six communities you know um, have have you know, a, a particular you know position that we think advances all of our interests collectively. I, I think that gives our, us a louder voice and 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 it also helps our, rep, our representation there. You know, be able to advocate um, even stronger for us. You know, knowing that we, we've all kind of come together. Um, so you know, any thoughts or comments relative to that? You know, certainly um, I, I, I would welcome. But I do see a lot of opportunity here for us as, as six neighboring communities to be able to do a lot of good. The whole uh, being greater than, than the sum of its parts. Uh, Councilor Stein from Wakefield, I see, is, is next with, with a hand up. Thank you. No, I, I just wanted to acknowledge. I, I actually think there's been a lot of great effort on the part of um, you know the town administrators across the communities. Uh, certainly, town administrator Mayo in, in Wakefield uh, and and his counterparts. Uh, you know the mayor's office in Melrose. I actually think there are a lot of areas where our communities have had. Uh, some really good examples of successful collaborations. And as I think about the communities that are on this call, I, I think in Wakefield, we've partnered with each one uh, in a variety of ways. And so, you know, certainly would agree that that's something that we should continue to explore. But I, I think we're starting from a place where we've got a really strong foundation as a region uh, in terms of working together collaboratively. And Again, really, really credit uh, Administrator Mayo and, and the other town administrators and, and mayors for uh, making that happen. Indeed, I spoke with the town administrator Mayo earlier today, and and I was telling him how you know several years ago when I was on the finance committee, I was so impressed with his ability to you know look at how we can do things differently. The town assessor, for example, we, we share that that role with with Reading. Um, we had shared, shared building inspector with with Linfield. You know, those are the sorts of things. So that there's no question that we have a very solid foundation by by folks like Mr. Mayo and, and the other town administrators, um, uh, Mayor Broder. Now I know Mr. Mayo, Mayo and um, Mayor Broder have a, a very good working relationship, um, as he does with 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 everyone. Um, you know, uh, Mr. Dolan, Mr. Sheehan, everyone. Um, and so we're we're very appreciative of that. So there's no question that I think that that the fundamentals are there, and, and we we. I think to your point, Councillor Chines, there has been success already shown. So this is a workable model for us. I think it's probably just one more of how, how we can expand it um, even further, um, especially so that our respective governing bodies can can be in better collaboration because it's certainly happening at that the at the, the leadership level for each. Any other comments or, or thoughts on, on that aspect of things? Seeing none, then I'll move on uh, next um, to item number eight, and that's that's access to testing. Um, I included that because I think it's it's pretty clear that going forward in, in, in the weeks and months ahead, the access to testing and the emphasis on testing will only you know, continue to to increase and, and be that COVID-19 testing, be it um, uh, antibody testing, which I know at, Right now, there's there's some d debate about it. it's 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 effectiveness and efficacy. I think we'll have a better sense of that um, within the next ten days. It sounds like, but there no doubt will be any number of tests that will be more streamlined, and and I, I think it it provides a unique opportunity for all of us uh, to think about how we may want to approach those those issues. Perhaps Wakefield alone can't do something, but if we partner with a couple of the communities that are interested in also doing it. We, we could you know, uh, really ramp up and expand that those opportunities for all of our residents. So um, again, you know, we're, we're not taking votes or having deliberations you know, uh, for this evening's purposes, but have, have any of the other communities uh, that, that are participating had similar discussions or, or, or kind of thought ahead, uh, spoken with your boards of health about that, that issue or, or how, how to make that happen? Um, 
It looks like I have um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Crabtree actually from Sonics. Good evening. I think you may be muted, Mr. Crabtree. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Yes. Uh, I just wanted to fantastic say fantastic thank you. backdrop. Oh yeah, thank you. Um, I just wanted to say thank you. We're really uh, great that you put this together. It's very informative. Uh, and I will say again, if you didn't hear me, you have a great man with uh, Mr. Mayo, and uh, he's a great administrator. Um, but I did want to say with the testing, uh, we were fortunate enough to partner up with uh, a facility up on Route 1 to at least have uh, our employees, first responders, Board of Health, to be able to get testing. And they're able to do the testing and get the results within 15 minutes. Um, so that's something that's really been uh, extremely, uh, I think, helpful for us, especially with. Um, trying to transition with uh, the Department of uh, Public Health and uh, the different uh, guidelines as far as quarantine and uh, isolation and what it's been helpful moving forward. Hopefully there'll be some guidance from the state or try to regionalize maybe some testing, um, you know, and I may be not as optimistic as everyone else, but I think we're going to struggle uh, with uh, businesses opening and some of these uh, youth events where parents are going to need to have more confidence to send their children, uh, even moving into the fall with schools. I mean, you see colleges that are looking at different models. Uh, and, and I think that's probably one of the important things is, is to plan for the worst um, and hope for the best. Um, so, but I think the testing thing is something I definitely be interested in, in speaking with uh, some of the managing administrators and mayor about trying to organize something that might be more regional uh, and accessible so that we can actually use that data to uh, that data to, to make decisions. Um, as we know, this is not easy. Everything, there's no right answer, there's no wrong answer, and each community has their own sort of flavor and sort of uh, influence over what they think is right or wrong and can take its own, uh, you know, viral uh, with social media. So, um, I commend everybody for doing what they can do. Each community is different, and this is definitely a challenge for all of us. But thank you for this forum. Thank you. Thank you for taking part. Um, next, I see Reading Select Board member uh, Karen Herrick with her hand up. We may need to have. I'm muted. Sorry. Yes, <laughs> testing, no testing. This is really important. I'm so glad you brought this up. Um, we were fortunate last week at our last select board meeting to have two of our state reps and Senator Lewis join us um, on our Zoom call. And this was a topic we we definitely raised to them. And I I think that is a terrific idea of a way that some of us or all of us might be able to um, co collaborate in in the short term or uh, might be longer term, but um, I, this is going to be an issue for us. And and I agree with the the previous speaker that let's be ready for the worst case scenario and hope for the best. And um, I don't know if the legislatures have already made the rounds to your town councils or your other select board meetings, but um, I, I'm glad we had the opportunity to share our concerns with them and hopefully they'll take it back. And of course, hearing from more of us will also, you know, make sure that that need is heard up at the state house. Certainly. Yes. Thank, thank you for that. And, and we, uh, we in Wakefield did have our delegation and it, and it was, it was helpful, um, to be able to, to, you know, discuss with them a number of issues for them to bring back, bring back to this, to the state house for us. Um, I do see that there is also an employee who is uh, dialed in from the public and, and she was uh, just offering the comment that it, it's important for all the municipalities to be make sure that testing is available for uh, municipal employees as well as residents within communities. So I, I think that, that that's an important reminder for all of us that when we're talking about residents, we also have, you know, when you think about school departments or any number of, of department employees, there's a lot of folks that, that, that are part of the community that we, we want to make sure we, 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 keep, we keep safe. Um, with that, I see uh, Councillor Chines from Wakefield has um, his hand up again. Councillor Chines. Uh, thank you. Just, just two brief comments. I, I, I think, first of all, I echo sort of the comments that folks have made around testing employees. I, I think particularly for some of the higher risk employees for each of our municipalities, um, you know, if we're talking about emergency workers and so forth, uh, you know, as we get to a, a time where 
you know, dealing with sort of a, you know, a, a long-term peak of COVID becomes our new normal. I think having some routine of regular testing for employees that are likely to come into contact with, with the public in high-risk situations is something we all need to be thinking about. Just the other point that I wanted to make with this, though, is that I think this is also an area where collaboration is not so, just something that should involve our six communities, but the healthcare systems that serve our communities as well. And, you know, certainly Lakey Health, Melrose Wakefield have done some great work. Uh, I think as we think about, you know, potentially a regional strategy for testing, they've got to be part of that conversation. Indeed, absolutely. And, and we're fortunate to have so many um, great healthcare providers within the region that we've defined. Do we have any other comments or, or questions or thoughts on that? If not, I'll, I'll move on then to the next. Um, and again, this, this is the broader topic of opportunities for regional collaborations or communications going forward in terms of services, econ um, economic and health. And, and again, we, we have some good structure in place now. And, and I credit a lot of, you know, again, our, 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 our mayor representative, our, our town administrators and our town managers they they work very well together, and they've been able to do a lot of lot of uh, really innovative um, um, thinking uh, for all of our communities that that have been a great benefit um, going forward. But I think the idea of, of services, you know, is is something that that we can always continue to focus on. And whether we're talking about a sharing of of of, of employees between two communities or or sharing a backhoe, as Mr. Mayo used as an example, you know, when needed, um, the ability for us to be able to um, you. Know, collaborate and, and have open communication, I think beyond this meeting, it would be really important for all of us, you know, and, and, and when the need arises, being able to be there, just as we're seeing within our communities, people coming together to take care of each other. I think we as, as a region can also come together and take care of each other, you know, when, when certain or unique needs you know, may arise. Um, so, you know, I, I put that out, out there more for all, all of us to consider, you know, going forward. And if anyone has any you know, particular thoughts or comments, or even maybe in need of a backhoe that, that Wakefield could loan out. We, <laughs> we certainly are, are happy to do it. Any comments or thoughts on that? I mean, is, is the general, yes, um, Vice Chair Parker from Stone Up. So I, first of all, I just want to thank you for putting this together because it, it's just really interesting. And I, and I think we're all on the same page when we say, you know, we want to work together and um, come up with great ideas. I was just hoping that if anybody had any, um, you know, somebody talked about a survey, um, any kind of documents that they're already been working on with their community, if they don't mind sharing them with the town administrator so we can just kind of all take a look and um, maybe, you know, something we're doing might help, you know, Melrose or, or vice versa, um, just so we can kind of, you know, share ideas and then maybe something else comes up out of that. And uh, yeah, we'll take it back home. <laughs> Fair enough. Any other community comments on that from any, any other municipalities? All right, seeing none, then I, the, the final item on the agenda is, is um, really can, could just be labeled, we're all in this together. And I, I think we're all you know, facing some of the similar challenges in terms of, again, our local receipts being down, um, our state uh, revenue being down, so undoubtedly state aid being down as, as a result, I believe. Um, some of the forecasting by Senator Lewis when he appeared before the Wakefield Town Council was something along the lines of 13 to 18 percent reduction in revenue anticipated, just forecasted out. A few caveats with that, obviously, where federal funding lands, we don't know yet. Um, that would be an important consideration and also uh, to what extent the state's rainy day fund would, would be um, tapped into. But I think there's no question that you know, all of us are finding that we'll, we'll need to um, figure out ways to make sure that we can meet our, our, our financial obligations with, with undoubtedly less revenue. Has, has, um, have any communities begun that discussion? Um, what sorts of approaches have you taken thus far? Or you have, has anyone forecasted out to kind of see where you expect to be? Maybe not in fiscal 20, but fiscal 21 and beyond. I'll first turn to Mr. Mayo on that because I know Mr. Mayo um, you have worked on that extensively for weeks. Yes, um, uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I am at this point uh, based on conversations with Jason Lewis and um, we actually had a forecasting meeting with our um, finance committee on this because we do get a lot of our income in uh, local receipts as well. I'm looking at um, very simply uh, starting with a 10% uh, uh, cut um, in local aid and a 10% um, 
uh, basically a 10% reduction in um, local receipts. The other item that I'm worried about um, uh, on, on the revenue side is um, uh, new growth. Um, we do have some, have been very blessed here to have some very good new growth over the last few years um, and some big progress that are started. Some have started, some are a little bit further along. We have the power line coming coming through that was uh, substation work has been done, thank, thankfully. I think that will go forward. Uh, so there may be some timing issues here, but we're, we're looking at about a 10% um, a uh, cut. Um, uh, would love to hear some from the other, uh, some of the other managers what they think. And I think we're kind of in the same ballpark from what I've heard already. Are there any other managers that, that have similarly forecasted out and have an expectation from any of the other communities? Um, Ed, it's Rob Dolan. Yes. Yes. Uh, I lived through 9-11 um, cuts and 08, 09 in my, in my previous job and now this. Um, in the earlier years, they were able to cut additional assistance, which was uh, something put in by Governor Dukakis. Uh, there was a significant cities and towns that have been around as long as our communities have. So we were looking at 12, 13, 14 percent reductions. Um, what I think will happen, my, my guess is that the new formula that you know Senator Lewis and others have worked so hard on is going to be uh, retracted back to the old formula. That's probably a billion right there. Uh, that hurts uh, a lot of communities. I think you'll hear the screams from, from a lot of communities. For a community like Winfield, I don't know, for talking to Steve um, Wakefield, it's not that much of a, not that much of a hit. Um, however, uh, AGA, what's called AGA, unregulated un, uh, uh, governmental aid, I do think that a 10% to 15% cut might be uh, the case. In terms of other, the new, old, going back to the old formula in Chapter 70, there's not much they can really cut there. Uh, a lot of it is by court order. And, and, and even in the worst of times, um, in the Great Recession, which obviously, you know, one could argue was not as bad as this or or, or, or was, they really couldn't cut uh, um, um, Chapter 70 outside the old formula. So the other the other areas which I think are concerned for school departments would be what they're going to do with the circuit breaker, transportation, et cetera. Uh, but we do know one thing, they will cut aid, but they will not cut or reduce regulation on us. That is that is obvious. I see I see uh, the Redding laughing. <laughs> I see you, Bob. Um, and, and that's that's certainly going to be the case, I think, here. So uh, in terms of cutting aid, I don't know if you can cut the whole number in terms of including Chapter 70, but I think you can certainly look at the uh, the, the uh, local town side uh, being reduced considerably. Indeed. I see that we have a Reading Town Manager, uh, Latcher, as our, our next handout. Um, thank you. Um, as Ed mentioned, um, state revenues look to be down you know, 14 to 18%. They have a rainy day fund, they had federal revenues, but they also have a lot of fixed costs that they can't really touch. So um, in a discussion with the Senator, um, I actually think our local aid, um, the smaller portion uh, could be cut by 25%. But I agree with Rob that uh, chapter 70 is gonna be much better protected. Um, which has less of an impact on most of the communities on this call compared to some of the cities, certainly. Um, but I'm, I'm with Steve, a 10% total state aid cut is what we're using as a forecast. And I think that's a little bit pessimistic. Uh, we're using an 8% loss in local revenues. Um, and that's because a lot of people that used to walk around the lake in Wakefield and spend money are now doing that in Reading. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> Um, something that we're concerned about, but we're in a good position to defend, is people who don't pay their tax bills in a timely way. And that's a cash flow issue. Uh, you know, property taxes are, are pretty much certain, but what happens when 20% of your customers can't pay? Um, I've, I've had discussions with the MMA and with the state in terms of some kind of bridge financing. That could be a that's not a revenue problem, that's a timing of revenue problem. And that's an area we just need to be careful of, especially for cities and towns that have low cash balances. So I, I think, um, you know, on balance, we are in, as, as municipalities, we are in far better shape than most of our peers in the rest of the country and most states and certainly the federal government. 
Um, ironically, Prop 2.5 has constrained us for many, many years, and now it's protecting us. We never spent as much as many governments did. So, um, you know, you won't see 10% across the board revenue reductions in Massachusetts communities. There's no way. Um, you might see, uh, at worst, uh, 5%. In Reading, we'll probably be less than 5%, closer to 3% total. And that's because property taxes, again, um, are protected. Thank you for that insight. Um, and we have town manager um, Crabtree from Saugus with his hand up next. So I would just echo the same concerns that the uh, my colleagues have talked about as far as cuts and uh, state aid. Um, and I think that uh, I agree that I think some of our communities here that are on the call are probably in a little bit better uh, position. Uh, I think Saugus may be a little different in the sense of what, you know, some of the concerns we have is we have a, a large commercial base. Uh, those buildings are vacant. Um, you know, some of them are vacant, some are used at all because of the shutdown with the restaurants and other essential businesses. So we are concerned about moving forward with abatements um, that will have an impact, you know, in the following year. Um, we're uh, also with the meals. We depend on about a million dollars a year in uh, meals occupancy tax. Um, so that, that, is certainly going to be disrupted. Um, so we may, you know, we, we, we also looking at water usage. Uh, water usage is going to be down for us. Um, so we're looking at possible deficits in the enterprise account. Um, count, count, uh, and, and things of that. Things of that. Uh, I think I got an echo. I think I got an echo. But anyways, but anyways that, that, that's with, with, you know, you know, trying to look at how we're going to, you know, ride the storm here for the next year or two uh, to keep things stabilized, um, looking at use, use of free cash and, and probably money in our stabilization. We're in a you know, pretty good position where we have a, almost $10 million in stabilization uh, and two or $3 million in free cash that's been certified uh, from, from this past fiscal year. Um, but I, you know, we're going to have to make those cuts and people are going to have to understand there may be you know, looking at uh, if this doesn't correct uh, in the near future at looking at uh, reductions in, in service and, and other things. Uh, again, uh, it's a it's stress for people that are responsible for this and uh, making sure that we can make payroll and, and have enough in our operating budget. I think just this fiscal year alone, there'll have to be some kind of uh, accommodations for uh, cities and towns to deal with those uh, revenue uh, expected revenues, and, and as uh, one of the uh, administrators talked about, the timing of receiving things. We've extended our tax deadline, um, you know, so that helps residents to some extent, but it also creates more timing issues because if they decide to pay later than that, you know, we're into a different fiscal year. Um, so, same concerns. I think this is still early and probably a challenging without having all the information or when this is sort of pandemic is going to sort of come to a softer landing. Um, so th those are the same concerns all the communities are, but I think it's good to have those conversations uh, within the communities. Indeed. Yes. Yes. Thank, thank you for that insight. And I see that uh, we have town administrator uh, Sheehan from Stoneham with his hand up as well. Yeah, so we when we did our initial projection between local aid and uh, um, local receipts, we did put in about 13%. Um, one of our concerns for us is we have a municipal ice arena, and when they talk about what happens in September and in the fall that this thing might come back, um, that's also a revenue concern for us in terms of um, you know, social distancing going to be happening on something like that. And that that's additional concern on top of what everyone else has said. Thank you for that. Seeing no new comments, then um, we'll just move on to, to the end, the closing remarks. So if anyone had anything else they wanted to offer up to, to everyone that's gathered here this evening, you know, um, this is your opportunity to, to do just that. I see uh, first we have, um, uh, we'll go with uh, Wakefield Town Councilor Maureen Butt first. Councilor Butt, good evening. 
Hi, everyone. Um, I realized we didn't do introductions at the start, and I know many of you, but I don't know all of you. So hello and goodbye. And a special hello to the person I've known the longest here, Chris Barrett from Linfield. We, him and I went to high school together, so it's nice to see you virtually. Um, I just want to echo some of the stuff that was said, total in support of the town managers and the uh, mayors, you guys have been leading us in the right direction and can't give enough credit to all the boards of health. Um, this is a public health crisis, and I think as much as we can defer to our public health experts, um, that's what we should be doing. They should be coming to our meetings and advising us, and they know better. We are not, I don't know, I think most of you are not public health um, experts. That's why we do this instead of the Board of Health. I do want to say I love looking at long term and fiscal budget and once we get back on track, but I just I want to remind everyone like to as as uh, mayor as Rob Dolan was saying like there's creativity happening right now and I just want to highlight that and share some of those things. So, you know, Malden, who's not on this call, has kind of closed off some roads so people can walk and made pedestrians streets and I think that's amazing and it's something like we should all be considering in this time. Um, our Wakefield food pantry that's seen 70% increase since the pandemic hit um, has found a way not to ask for people's IDs which you know means more people get the food that they need and I think if that's something that continue if there's things in town that we don't have to make ID dependent or don't have to have people come in and fill out forms and can do it online like we should really those are kind of the things that now in crisis mode to help the most amount of people and then um, you know a, a plug to my fellow counselor Paul Donato who's really Donaco, sorry, um, who's really working with um, the, the again, the restaurants in town and trying to figure out a way. So like Cambridge, the city Cambridge, city council in Cambridge is streaming movies um, that everyone can watch on probably on their local access. And then they're encouraging people to do takeout and movies at home. Like what a cool idea, right? Doesn't cost us a lot, but like, again, inspiring people to go out and eat. So I just, uh, you know, we see these on social media, these ideas. If you guys have any of them, let us know. A lot of them are working with nonprofits like the biking group in Malden or the food pantry in Wakefield. But I think, you know, part of our job right now in crisis mode is to kind of highlight these new ways of helping the people who need help now. Thank you for that, uh, Councillor. But um, from Saugus, I, I see that, that town manager Crabtree did have his hand up. Is that still the case? Uh, no, I, I just I was making a comment about uh, just the, I was interested. Not not that I want to start the conversation about our, our budget is uh, in Saugus. It's interesting, and you guys may be in different situations, but. We uh, the budget in August has already been submitted. I submitted a budget uh, by charter back on uh, February fifteenth. So we're now going to, and we were partly through the finance committee hearings. We're now going to have to go through a process of uh, changing and modifying that budget that that was the preliminary estimated budget. Uh, but I think other towns are on on different uh, schedules with the budget and maybe just proposing or putting budgets together. Um, for submission, but that, that was my comment from the last topic. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I see that we have um, now um, select board chair, a doctor from Reading. Is that hand still up? Nope, didn't cancel. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, Thanks okay. everyone for, for joining. Um, Maureen, it was great kind of hearing those comments. I'm wondering if we can think about kind of where to take this going forward a little bit. Um, it would be great to get some of these new ideas circulated through this group on a regular basis because they're going to happen regularly, um, probably more frequently than, than all of us are going to be able to get a couple hours to sit down together and chat. So I'm wondering if they maybe think about a way to kind of get ideas flowing that way. The other thing is, um, if people don't mind, could we share kind of our email addresses, kind of have a, a list of the folks who participated here and different board members and things so that we can, you know, there may be things, you know, I, I noted a couple of things I want to talk to people about, but that'd be a nice way to be able to follow up and then maybe talk about when would be a good time to have another meeting. Um, because I think this is a great idea to get us talking together, thinking about, you know, how we can work together, um, particularly where, you know, we share in some cases legislators and in other cases not. And that's great. Um, we've been talking, I've been talking, Ann Landry's been talking, Bubba Lasher's been talking um, with the MMA also. 
and um, trying to have them help us with some of the, the issues that we're facing. They have some experience, um, but sometimes we need special things for our communities and, and kind of working through them as well. So anyway, thank you. Much appreciated. Thank you for, for writing strong participation tonight, too. We do appreciate that. I see that we have a Wakefield Town Councilor uh, Dinako with his hand up next. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my discussion or my comments are going to be more on um, how we are going to best approach the businesses uh, going forward as we try to navigate out of uh, this uh, COVID crisis right now. Um, I've listened to a lot of the comments made by uh, various uh, communities on how, what their thoughts are. I, I think that if we're going to have a, a bigger issue right now in addressing the, the small businesses than most um, are really grasping onto at the moment. I, I look at long range right now. Um, I know for a fact Reading, I know Melrose, I know Wakefield, I know Stoneham, all have big events that come up in September. How are you planning to enter into September at this point in time if, if, if we can't, if we don't know how the merchants are going to be able to be dealt with right now? We don't know whether or not we're going to be able to allow full capacity or not. We're not going to know whether or not there may be a, a resurgence in um, or, uh, uh, an, ex an explosion back where the uh, coronavirus is now coming back. How do we deal with the small businesses at this point? Uh, how's the other communities going to deal with that right now? Uh, working in, I didn't hear any game plans coming out from any of these on how to move forward. Is there any thoughts on how you're going to proceed with these business activities that are set forth to come out in the future? The town manager, um, the Latcher from Reading has, has his, his, his hand raised as does Mr. Mayo as well. Uh, thanks, Ed. Um, our economic development director, as I mentioned before, working with the chamber is actually creating a toolkit for re-entry for businesses of different types um, you know, town managers never have any original thoughts. We just share them with each other. So I'm sure we'll do that. I have to pick up the, the best, uh, the best proven thoughts of everyone else. It's, that's great. Right. Um, Mr. Mayo from Wakefield. Business, excuse me, the whole, the whole business point is well taken and uh, I'll be happy to uh, plagiarize uh, the toolkit from uh, Reading. Thank you very much on that uh, and, and work together. I just wanted to um, uh, thank our chair for putting this together and I want to thank um, all the board members, but uh, special thanks to my, um, my manager and uh, my manager friends and uh, I miss you guys. We have to figure out to have uh, breakfast together soon. Um, I think we could all get a, uh, uh, egg McMuffin and sit around the <laughs> sit around my lake. I'll let you guys sit around my lake and we'll, um, uh, you know, socially distance somewhere. But uh, thank you for being part of it. And I think uh, we are much better when we uh, work together. So thank you all. Indeed. And, and um, I'll just close the thing though for the comments with th again, thanking everyone for taking part this evening. Um, I'll, I'm working with Mr. Mayo and we'll put together a debrief that we're, we're, we'll be sharing with everyone. Uh, who is taking part this evening. And then that allows you to, to be able to share that with your boards or department heads. Um, we'll also make this call available, this this video conference available. Um, we'll send that via email so everyone has that and you can feel free to um, disseminate that um, amongst um, those within your communities. Uh, this is what I hope uh, was the first of many really important uh, meetings and collaborations that we can have as a region. I do hope that we that this, this notion of, of you know, taking a regional approach and, and coming together is one that uh, will will uh, be started now and, and will continue on for for many years to come. Um, if if there is an interest in in 
convening again, certainly I think that would probably be an appropriate thing for us to do. So, you know, we can talk certainly offline on, on what those that scheduling might look like and, and get some sort of rhythm, you know, going forward. And we will, of course, share everyone's contact information. So any direct follow-ups, you know, can be made that way. But, but again, I thank all of you for taking the time this evening. Um, I think this is a really important uh, beginning dialogue. And, and uh, with, with that, I, I will say uh, good evening to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great night. Thanks, Ed. Thank you, everybody. Carlo, can I have a motion from you to adjourn? Oh, sure. Uh, oh, God. <laughs> um, motion to adjourn uh, the regional summit meeting. Is there a second? Second. second. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we got to go roll call. So I can see Ann. Uh, yes. Karen. Yes. Carlo. Yes. Vanessa. Yes. And Mark. Yes. We're adjourned. Reading. Thank you very much, all. Thank you.